Thanks a lot for being here, pulling through two days of uh, sessions. And uh, one thing I noticed today is I've been sitting through uh, here from the morning, and everybody's talking about the audience, the users, the collaboration, and especially Magadora's talk previously was like kind of like the uh, you know everything in one. And my talk is kind of the same thing, except my audience is you, and you know so users are you. And my, uh, our team designs products for you folks to use. And this talk is kind of around web design, but uh, it's not going to be about technical details about web design. And like everybody else has been talking about, it's kind of the process of web design and how that has changed uh, from the past to now. And this talk evolved out of what we, our team did at Adobe. Um, it was like, Two years ago, we were at some place where we were like, OK, there's something we are offering, and then there's the place where people are, and there's some gap there. And we need to identify what that gap is. And so this talk is basically the culmination of our research into identifying what that gap is and how we are fulfilling on that gaps and how we can offer things around that gap. So before I go further, I think the first thing that we need to talk about, uh, we kind of hinted at it, we kind of walked about it, which is uh, responsive design, because that has completely changed the way we do our websites, and we create the process, the whole culture of web design has changed because of responsive design. Um, and we keep saying responsive design without quite identifying what that means, and I just want to identify some of these things that go into what is a responsive design. So this is a beautiful website of Web Visions. It's really amazing. It's very well done. So congratulations, Brad, and your team. Um, so this is a responsive website. And the way I know that is that when I move things, the design breaks. Um, there's a different design. The design is altered when there's a break in the design, in the pre-existing design. So you can also see here that the sponsor's text you know, looks different. It's moved slightly because it looks better. And then at some point, the whole navigation area changes. As you can see, now there is the navigation drop-down menu. And this all happens in the context of the device width. You could also do it in the context of the height, the, the, uh, the pixel resolution, and so on and so forth. And all of these design decisions are deliberate choices that have been made, uh, and not because it's been optimized for iPhone or iPad. It's because this design is a, you know, like a liquid design that works for all uh, widths and sizes. So in terms of responsive design, the main uh, characteristics of responsive design is design you know, is altered when the existing design breaks at a breakpoint. And you have to identify what that breakpoint is. It could be the width or the height. It could be the resolution, anything of that sort. And then you create a new design on that breakpoint. And it could be based on the, you know, you could say the width of a certain element is a certain percentage of the canvas, or you could say the font size is different, or maybe the whole entire layout is altered based on the new design breakpoint. And uh, it took a long while for us to start caring about responsive design. Um, and I think even now, a lot of folks are like, I don't think I need to do responsive design. I can do adaptive design, and I can live with that. You know, like Google does adaptive design, Facebook does adaptive design, why can't I do adaptive design and be with that? So I'll just serve optimized websites for iPhones and iPads, and I'll be fine. Why do I need to do responsive design? And there's a reason why you should be caring about responsive design. And the reason is this, like the global smartphone sales. Um, it's like an exponential growth in the global smartphone sales. A lot of people are buying smartphones today. And it's also very interesting because a lot of countries are just leapfrogging into the smartphone world from the landline world. For example, Myanmar has not seen people don't use a mobile, line, a mobile phone that doesn't have data. They don't know what that means because they just went into from landline to a completely connected data world where they get Android phones. And it's all cheap. So it's not like it's very expensive. The other thing is the average screen size has always been exponentially growing. And uh, it's not like you can optimize for one thing and expect it to hit a lot of audience. So people who are going to be visiting the sites that you design are going to be coming from any of these uh, you know, device widths. So it could be any of these screen sizes. 
The other thing to know is that uh, a lot of people who visit websites are doing so when they are doing something else on the, on the side. So it's not like they're going to be dedicated to your website, and it's not like they have the care to stay on your website. If it doesn't help them while they're doing something else, then they're going to leave. So it could be that somebody is watching Game of Thrones and you know, thinks that the throne that they show on Game of Thrones would be an interesting you know, furniture to have. And maybe you're designing a website to sell the throne uh, as a furniture piece. And so if you are someone who's designed for it, and if you don't optimize for TV audience, how are you going to sell that furniture? People are just going to come to your website on the tablet or the phone and be unable to you know, buy it from there and be like, OK, I'll do it later. And then later never happens. How many of you have websites in your reading list? Yeah. And how many of you actually read it? I don't know, very few people, I think. Um, and then the other shift that has happened is that the hours that we spend on the internet has changed. It used to be that we would spend most of the hours on the internet on the desktop. But now, most of the hours that we spend on the internet are on your phones and tablets and other mobile devices. And it's only increasing. So if you do, your websites are not ready for your mobile phones and tablets, then you know, it's not ready to be consumed by your end users. But this is kind of difficult, like moving to this world where you know, we put responsive design as a default view, not a des the desktop design is no longer the, you know, the primary way of designing. But you start from mobile first, you start from uh, thinking of the smartphone users first. That's really difficult to do. And the reason is also the way we have been designing websites, the process itself has changed significantly. It used to be, you know, as people were saying, there was a waterfall model, you know, how there, and even, before, even, the, even in the waterfall model, there used to be very few people involved in design. There were not so many different exp experts, you know, coming to design. But now we have multiple stakeholders. You have multiple kinds of experts coming into design. You have the UX designer. You know, who has the whole holistic view of how this website should behave, how the experience should be. And then you have the programmers having their own view of what is possible or not, and what is you know, performant or not. And then you would also have like, creative directors ex you know, expecting your designs to be in a certain manner, be you know, like fitting the vision or the brand of the agency or the feel of the agency. And finally, there's like the elephant in the room who's the end, end user, you know, who Magadora was mentioning, who actually pays our bills, our, our salaries, uh, but we never talk about, we pretend like they don't exist, uh, and uh, you know, rarely care about them. And then it's the client who say, who has their own views of how websites should, be, should look like or should be designed, and we pretend like they are, are real people who pay for us. Then I think the biggest problem uh, right now in the world of design is that there are a lot of design decisions that happen outside of your design tool of choice. Um, so if you're doing responsive uh, web design, then there's how, what web safe font do you use? You know, when your you know, Typekit font or the web font that you want to use fails to load. And that's a design decision you cannot take in your design tool. You have to take it outside when you know, we actually see the page loading and it's really slow and nothing appears on the screen. Um, how should the page look like on poor internet connections? You know, internet connections can be poor or like very fickle anywhere. It doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't matter whether you are, you know, in San Francisco or any other place with like fiber optic connection, it doesn't matter. It, it can happen any time. So you cannot say your website will only work in a very high speed internet connection because that would mean you are like eliminating a vast majority of users from visiting your website. So how would that page look like when there's poor internet connection? You need to design for that, and there's no design tool available for that. Then how does you know, CSS3 change things? Like maybe you, know, you want to use, uh, you know, you know, now there's the, apparently there's a trend of using um, circular avatar images. Everybody wants to use circular avatar images. And a lot of times, the way we do it is to use border radius. And then you have some websites that have a lot of border radius imposed circular avatar images. And the problem is when you're loading those pages on your mobile phones, when you scroll, they're very, very laggy. And the reason is the border radius. And scrolling on border radius is going to make it really slow. So at that point, you need to make a design decision. Should I live with the circular avatar images? Or can I you know, change it to something else? Should I make it a static circular avatar image? Or should I just have it square? 
So all of these design decisions don't happen when you design, but they happen after the fact. Then what about retina screens? You know, half the sites that I visit now, even now, you know, it's been so long since retina has been introduced, it's still blurry. There are a lot of images that still, you know, are not optimized for the higher resolution. So what do we do there? And those decisions, again, happen outside of your design canvas. You could be designing your retina screen, and then you have to go back and see how it looks like on non-retina screens. And that's something, again, you need to look at outside of your canvas. And it also used to be that when you're designing for the browser, uh, you know, there were like four browsers. They were horribly independently implemented, but there were only four of them. So you could at least be satisfied that you're only testing for four browsers. But now you have 10 browsers. And uh, I say 10 because, you know, each version, the mobile version of each browser is very different implementation compared to the desktop version. So if you say, if you are looking at a page in Chrome, and pretend like if you change the width in your desktop Chrome and your page might mimic the mobile Chrome, you're mistaken, because mobile Chrome behaves entirely differently. And so you need to test your, brow your website in all of these flavors of browsers, and not everybody has the QE budget to do that. And so uh, that also impacts the end result, the end, uh, end website that we create. So these are the things that we knew existed, but we were like, what can we do? What are, what are, where are our tools, uh, where, where do our tools play in this process of creating websites for you know, responsive websites? And what can we do to make that better for designers, developers, teams that use our tools? So um, we kind of did like a discovery phase where we just went and talked to people you know, talk to users like you. So we were, spoke to around 38 people. It included about 10 freelancers. And we spoke to people in different countries. So we wanted to get a feel of what's the process like across the world. Um, and then we spoke to people in about 20 agencies. We really wanted to understand how the team worked with our tools, you know, and where we were not uh, measuring up, up to those teams. Specifically, we asked certain questions around these things. Like, we asked questions around workflows. Um, you know, what's your workflow like when you s start a design project? What do you create? Who do you give it to? And then what are the tools that you use to create these workflow, uh, you know, these um, things that you create for this project? And then we asked about problems. What are the issues that you have? What are the things that, was, uh, that stop you from doing your best in this project? So the answers that we got was kind of interesting because these are the kind of answers some of them I expected completely, and some of them I did not expect at all. Um, so one thing that I expected, which was true, is that most people were not satisfied with their design process um, that existed. So it used to be that, and all of them said they used to follow a certain process, and now it's all different. It's different per project, it keeps getting, it's keep getting changed, they keep trying new things. The other thing that I have noticed is that um, uh, there was an increasing collaboration. So a lot of folks, even though the process is changing, it, uh, the workflow is changing, there was a lot of increased collaboration amongst people. Um, I even talked to an agency where they had like an outsourced development uh, you know, a team that was located in another country, and they actually have been moving more and more developers to work with their designers side by side uh, in their headquarters. And that's something that has changed, uh, uh, that has been more and more we are seeing. Um, the other thing that we noticed is that, this was surprising to me, is that people liked using their existing design tools. You know, if you had, if you're using Photoshop for web design, you liked using Photoshop for web design. If you're used to Illustrator, people were using Illustrator, some people were using Sketch. It's like, they liked using their design tools for design. But um, as they were collaborating more, they found their design tools wanting. So they're, because of increased collaboration, Existing design tools didn't measure up to that collaboration space. But the other thing I also noticed was that even though people liked using design tools and they had some problems, but they still continued to want to use those tools that they were using, um, they didn't want to update their design tools. Um, how many of you are on CS5? Okay, that was released like six years ago, I think. How many of you are on CS6? Okay, at least that's not that old. But as you can see, not many people are willing to update. How many of you are in CC? 
Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad. There's a lot more people. So, um, so a lot of folks didn't want to update the design tools. It doesn't matter whether you're a designer, developer. There's, you know, it's not about what you do, but it's just the very act of updating your design tools causes a lot of fear in people. And that's interesting to me because uh, you know, a lot of us update our browsers without a thought. Nobody thinks twice about updating Chrome and prefers it auto-updates. But that's not the case with design tools. The other thing that we learned was that um, people did not, people learned things while they were you know, in the universities. Uh, people learned things uh, like when they went to a workshop. Or like they had these things that they learned when they were younger and then continued using them without knowing if things have changed or is there new stuff. So there was very less patience to learn new things because you know, you're in the process of creating projects, completing projects. There was very little time to downtime to spend learning your tool to be more efficient in the design world. And that was interesting as well because uh, you know, a lot of times at Adobe we consider you know, providing the most features that we can to, make you to, to enable you to make the right decision with your design but we don't consider that you ha you know, there's very little time for people to learn how to use all of these features that we provide to, make it, to do that best design possible. And that was uh, something that you know, we realized later on. Ultimately, it also came down to three big things that you know, we took away. One of this, which was uh, the clients that most of these agencies worked with did not understand responsive design. For them, responsive design was a checkbox that they just have to click. And agencies was frustrated with that because then it takes a long, the process becomes in more cumbersome and more painful with the clients who don't understand responsive design. I think this is changing a little bit, but uh, this is something that's still ongoing complaint. The other thing is it's really hard to keep pace with changing browser sets, uh, browser feature sets. Like, you know, it, I, I talk to many developers at agencies um, and then I would be asking them, so what do you, do you use Flexbox? And then how many of you know what's Flexbox? OK, a lot more than I expected, which is good. Um, then you know, many developers would tell me, uh, that what is Flexbox? And then I would be like, OK, so Flexbox is a way you can lay out things that is really, you know, really powerful, gives you a lot of oh, easy ways to do this. And it works in all the modern browsers. And they'd be like, oh, I never knew that it started working. I heard about it. But I didn't know it was working in all the modern browsers. So there's all these, it's really hard to keep pace uh, with the changing browser uh, feature set. Also, I think this is the biggest takeaway that we had, uh, was it's really tedious to update designs for different devices. Um, especially like if you are creating designs for multiple mobile, tablet, uh, desktop, or whatever. And then you're, you have to be like, okay, I need to change this red to be some other red um, on all of, these all, all of these designs. And that's a little tedious. And I think more than the design process itself is the tediousness of the update that really puts people off uh, of creating websites for responsive design. So if we were to go back to uh, the responsive design process and you know, this, like where we are uh, with design, I think I wanted to break it down into slightly different ways of thinking about it. And the first thing that I, I think we kind of don't look at it in that way, but I think we should start looking at it this way, is that responsive design begins when you know where your design breaks. And this is weird to put it before you actually start designing, but you know, once you know where your design breaks, then it's easy to use your favorite design tool to start designing for those uh, breaks where design, those design breaks. And then you just implement those designs for that breaks. And the reason why this is better is that um, when you de determine where the design breaks, as soon as you determine that, design and development can happen in tandem. At that point, if, then it becomes faster and more iterative to create the end result that you want. So let's look at what it means to determine where the design breaks. I think the way you would determine where the design breaks is first of all, sketch your design. You know, you have ideas around your design, so it's very easy to just sketch the design in your notebook, whatever, and then create a prototype of your design. So you know exactly the kind of content that's gonna go into your website. You know what's gonna be an image, what's gonna be text, and um, you, know, you have something, some idea in your head, 
So the way you could do, you could use Adobe Muse, you could use Dreamweaver, you could use whatever that's very basic, Twitter Bootstrap, Squarespace, anything that's really basic to create like a very, you know, fundamental prototype of how it might look like, just rough prototype. Have a URL, load the URL, look at it in your phone, look at it in the tablet, and see where, which of these elements need to be fixed, which of these elements will be flexible, you know, which of these elements will uh, take in 50% width. Maybe look at it in a retina screen and not retina screen and, and you know, determine which of these images need to be you know, retina ready. And maybe you have icons and maybe you know because you're using retina screens, these icons need to be in SVG or font or something like that. And when you do this rough prototype, you may also get a, an idea of the kind of grids that you will be using. So if you ha have like a grid framework that's already ex in existence, then you can say, okay, for this width, it's gonna be um, eight columns, and for this width, it's gonna be two columns. And so once you have the prototype, you no not only know where the design breaks, you also know the grid framework that you're gonna be using. And you have a lot of design decisions. All of those design decisions that happen outside of the canvas, all of those decisions are something that you can now know and agree to with your team on what that will be. And now you're kind of ready to start designing. So once you have the grid um, that you've determined in the prototype, now it's time to design for those breakpoints that you've already determined. And it's kind of fairly simple. So now I'm gonna be, I'm using Photoshop for my talk, and this is a Photoshop document. And uh, so I said, same, use the same grid as prototype, and in, uh, in the latest Photoshop, I introduced something known as guide layout. How many of you know about this new guide layout? Okay, a few people. So new guide layout basically uh, allows you to set whatever guides you want, eight column, 12 column, and you can then save these presets and use it out of the box. So immediately I have parity with my implementation. The other thing that we introduced was uh, this concept of linked smart objects. How many of you know that? Oh, not many at all. Okay. So um, this, this object here, this is called a linked smart object. When I double click on it, as you see, it's a separate instance of a Photoshop. It's a, it's a Photoshop file that's external. So whenever I change things in this Photoshop file, it gets reflected in, the in my existing file. So for example, now I have the heart here because I changed something in that Photoshop file. So now it's very easy to reuse then because all I have to do is to create an external phot uh, Photoshop object and then change that. And then as soon as I change that, any other files that use that uh, as a link smart object will get updated with the latest version. Finally, it is to collaborate with the same unit system. And I think that's the biggest um, barrier we have seen as well, because when you're designing in Photoshop, you're using pixels. But when you're uh, using CSS, you're using rems and ems and percentages. So we introduced this thing recently called uh, Creative Cloud Extract. And uh, what you can do is upload your PSD files on the browser, and you'll be able to open them up in this view um, in called Extract View. And as soon as you click, you can click on these layers and get the CSS values for them in the, in the kind of format you want. So you can get your preferred font units as RAMs, Ms, or PX. You can set your base font size. It can be 16 or it could be 32. And based on that, the font size here will change as well. So you can get the CSS in pure CSS or SAS or whatever that you use, preferably. And, oh, oh, what happened? Okay, oh, I redid that. Okay, let me go back. Uh, okay, but, so here we are. And the other thing that is possible with this is you can also get measurements uh, like between layers. So I can select two things and now I can get measurements in pixels. Um, or I can choose to have the measurements in percentages and now I have the measurements in percentages with accuracy. Okay. 
So at least what this enables you to do is to have elevated conversations amongst yourselves as a team. So it's no longer about, oh, this font size is wrong, this uh, particular element is not, this, you know, the logo is not changed, the logo color is old, or, you know, those kinds of conversations need not happen. Instead, the conversation is elevated and it's about, okay, is the user being successful or is the user not being successful? Or, you know, like a conversation that enables you to do better design. So, this we have done, and then we go into implementing the design. Because you, have already ha you already have your prototype, now you're doing this in parallel with your design job. So you have the prototype, you have the grid, so you can start using the same grid as your prototype while you're implementing the design. And when you're implementing the design, also have an inventory of features that you'll be using. Um, and this is really useful not just for yourself while you're implementing things, because as soon as you have an inventory of features, for example, here's one thing that uh, I worked on a long time ago that I no longer maintain, but somebody else does. Um, it's now called, H it's called HTML5, please. And what I did was um, uh, essentially have a list of all the new features in HTML5 with the suggestion whether you want to use it now or not. So you can make a list like this for yourself, but it's specific to your team, depending on you know, how open the team is for cutting edge features or not. And the other thing that is really useful here is that um, we also provide, like, what are the fallbacks that you should be using? And, you know, where can you find these fallbacks? Uh, you know, like, maybe there's a polyfill. And if there's polyfill, if polyfill, what polyfill should you be using? And these things are useful because, you know, everybody can look at it and everybody trusts this information. And so it's not like the designers are unaware of what's possible. Now, when you have this, this information handy for everybody to use, then Nobody has to talk to each other, you know, like have like this lack of trust, like designers, sometimes designers don't trust developers to tell the right thing, but when you have this kind of a, a standard, uh, you know, feature list, inventory of features, then everybody knows what to trust, and so the conversation, again, is much more elevated. It's not no longer trivial things about should I use border radius or not. The other thing that I think a lot of developers will disagree with me, but um, this is something I've learned the hard way, which is to use responsive frameworks. And this, this might sound weird coming from somebody who created uh, HTML5 boilerplate uh, with Paul Irish, but uh, this, it's really important that you use responsive frameworks that exist and that are popular. And the reason being that I told you there are like 10 browsers and there are more obscure browsers every day. And it could be that your website is very popular in China. And in China, there are like 20 variants of Trident, um, 20 different versions and flavors of Internet Explorer that exist, and that we don't even look at, and that we don't even try. So uh, if you're using responsive frameworks, there would be contributors you know, amongst the hundreds of them who have patched those frameworks to work on those browsers. And so you can take advantage of the QE that's been done for you by all of these contributors to your, uh, to these frameworks. So you can spend, minimize the time you spend on QE. So finally, I think the question that gets asked a lot today is responsive or adaptive. Should you optimize your website for a certain, uh, you know, like a browser? Should you optimize your website for a Safari iPhone or a Safari on the iPad? Uh, or do you want to optimize it for Chrome, or do you want to optimize it for Chrome on a certain Android tablet? I think then it becomes uh, something that you need to consider uh, on like project by project basis, but ultimately consider responsive as a foundation. When you do responsive web design, you are creating something that is valuable to anyone who comes and visits your website from anywhere. And so that is useful by default. But it is also possible that a lot of your paying users are coming from a certain browser and use data for that. I think that's really something that I, we did not cover much today of is using data to make your design decisions and your development decisions. You know, it could be that you know, people are no longer buying on a certain browser because on that browser that, just, that page simply fails to load. And you can't know that until you look at the metrics and measure whether that's true or not. And it could be also be that some of the design decisions you've made has also have implications in the purchases that happen. 
or it could be that some users are not visiting your site because a lot of them are colorblind and you're using colors that are not contrasting enough. And so use those data, use, talk to users, uh, understand and empathize with what they're trying to do, and use those to build cases for whether you should be responsive or adaptive. It could be that you know, there's a, a certain use, a set of users who use the iPad and uh, Safari predominantly who visit the website, and maybe it's worth it to make a separate app for them. And that could be a separate decision you make, you know, independent of this decision you're making. Ultimately, make sure you're serving those optimized um, sites only if needed, and do it very responsibly. So it, there are a lot of times, you know, you're trying to do like a user agent detection, and it d detects some unknown browser because you did not consider that uh, use case when you're doing those user agent detections. So be wary and make sure you're doing these things responsibly. So I'm almost done with my talk. Um, in summary, I think what has happened is responsive design has completely changed the game for how we design websites. And it's also necessary, and there's a lot of data that agrees that responsive design is very important for anything that you're now starting on for websites. There are a lot of design decisions that, that happen because your responsive uh, uh, design requires these decisions to happen in the browser and not in your design canvas. So that means your process needs to adapt to make those design decisions that happen outside of your design canvas first, and then work on your design canvas after. So you can do that by having a rough prototype ahead of time. You can create it with Adobe Muse, you can create it with Squarespace, you can create it with whatever, and use those, create those URLs and test it out. Um, see where those design decisions need to be made. And then just use your design tool, whatever you're using. It could be Photoshop, Illustrator, Sketch. And then it becomes far easier design to happen since, uh, once you do that. Finally, these design tools have features that make re responsive designs easier. For example, I just showed you the new guide layout and the linked smart objects. Um, and there are a few more coming out uh, in uh, Adobe tools to make that process better than the Creative Cloud Extract that I showed you. And there are other features and other tools as well. So, you know, I think that's something that we miss out on is learning these tools to make us better and more efficient in design. So learn and use them to be more productive with responsive design. So that's all I have. Thank you for your time. I think I have time for questions. Any questions? Yes. Oh. Yeah, I was actually going to do like a demo, but I, oh, hold on. So let's go Google.com. It's my favorite site for doing adaptive design demos. Hopefully, it loads. Oh, it does load. OK. So um, if, you, if you notice, if I reduce the width or whatever, you can see a scroll bar. Nothing changes. Everything is kind of like fixed. And what's interesting is if I change the user agent, though, if I change the user agent to an iPad, um, the page reloads. So it's a different page that's going to be served if it loads. But uh, <laughs> stop syncing your Dropbox. I don't know. Um, but when you when I reload it with this new user agent, it will show you uh, like uh, you know the the screen on top. If you open it in an iPad or something where it says you can use the Google app to open Google.com, get the app, which is almost like mimicking an iPad experience. And then it shows you, uh, you can use OK Google from your phone to search in Google and things like that. It's, it looks completely different. So that's the adaptive view. Even in Facebook, it does the same thing. It uh, adapts for different screen sizes, different user agents, um, and then different operating systems even. And uh, this is something that. Google and Facebook can afford to do because they have army of engineers, uh, well-paid engineers, who can work on niche things. And for them, the niche market is pretty high number. 
Uh, it could be like at least a million users who are using Chrome, Facebook on Chrome or Facebook on an Android tablet. Uh, that's an old Android tablet. And so that's, that's kind of like a reason why adaptive is used by them. But I, I, I mean, unless you have that kind of army of engineers to work on your uh, project, I think it's really difficult to um, uh, say adaptive is the right way to go. There's somebody at the back. Yeah, I mean, uh, my Twitter account is at Divya, so uh, sometimes I may tweet about that, but uh, the official Photoshop account is at Photoshop, which also sometimes tweet about that, but you also have this account called Adobe Web CC, um, so that might also be useful. Uh, Rich, who is our marketing manager, is behind, who's now covering, who's hiding. Don't hide. Uh, what's the, hi, uh, what's the Twitter handle? <laughs> okay, fine. So those are our Twitter handles that we can use. <laughs> Does it work? Oh. Hi. Yes. <laughs> one, one of the things you were talking about earlier was how people are resistant to change mm -hmm. um, and upgrade their design tools. Yep. Um, what's, how does Adobe deal with that now with the new philosophy? Um, is it about baby steps or can you explain that? Yeah, so how does it, uh, I think for us introducing Creative Cloud has been pretty useful in getting people to adapt slightly more often than it used to be before. Um, and I think we are also trying to do some changes on the server side to enable updates to happen much more quickly and it's more in your face. But I don't think, we also enable you to turn on auto updates. We ask you to do that and uh, not many people choose that again. So it's all, again, baby steps, um, as you were saying. It's really hard to, it's not even about convincing the users, it's also about convincing the IT teams in agencies that you need to update and a lot of IT teams do not want that option. So we are trying to get them to update and that's, that's also happening. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs>